Now that we've spent a great deal of time looking at the administrator, we're going to spend some time using the Query Browser. The Query Browser is similar to Microsoft's Query Analyzer in that it allows you to execute queries and stored routines, which include, of course, procedures and functions on any number of MySQL servers. But it has many advanced features, including bookmarking, back and forward, as well as the ability to export your queries to standard query files and many many other features that we're going to look at. So let's minimize this putty window, return to the browser and we're going to navigate to dev.mysql.com. We're going to navigate also to the download section and we're searching for the query browser. Let's find it and we should see it momentarily. Here it is. This is the query browser. We're going to get the latest version which runs on Windows. Let's click on download. It's five megs. It should be down very, very quickly. And this will save to a default location of the desktop. Once it's finished, we'll install it. Again, the MySQL administrator is to some degree modeled after Microsoft's SQL Enterprise Manager in that it allows you to connect and check the health and well-being of your MySQL servers and to some degree it allows you to write, run queries and execute stored routines whereas the query browser is modeled after Microsoft's SQL Query Analyzer in that it focuses primarily on the ability to execute queries on the server. Let's go ahead and install it. It's an MSI package so it should install very quickly with as few prompts as possible and we'll go ahead and select custom so that you see the options that are available the only option is the query browser nothing else and it takes approximately or utilizes approximately 10 megabytes on the disk which is no big deal we'll have this up and running momentarily and once it's there we'll be able to run it let's navigate into start all programs and search for the MySQL group and in the MySQL group there's a new icon for the query browser here are the original icons one is the system tray icon which will monitor instances for us the other as you know is the MySQL administrator which we just spent some time in certainly you should revisit that particular utility to, as frequently as possible to make use of its capabilities now let's take a look at the query browser this is where we're going to spend the remainder of the time discussing these graphical tools. It pops up similar to the administrator in that it prompts you for connection related information. If you have a stored connection you can use it from the list. Now, If you recall we didn't store a connection for the last connection that we made to Linux CBT DB1. We stored a connection temporarily to make to the remote server rather than permanently. We can go ahead and store that connection with its credentials by clicking on the ellipsis which brings up a separate utility. Both the SQL administrator as well as, or MySQL administrator as well as the query browser share the same connection repository. So if you define a connection here as there is one in the history, if we define it here, we can then use it and reuse it between both utilities. If we go ahead and add new connection, it sets up a new connection. What you see here is what's represented in the history. So we're going to call this particular connection Linux CBT DB1 so that both tools can share it. And the username is Linux CBT, followed by Linux CBT's password. And the host name, as you know, is Linux CBT DB1. Linux CBT internal, the fully qualified DNS name. We'll specify a default schema of HR, but it could be any of the schemas that are defined or any of the databases. Notice for types, MySQL, Oracle, ODBC, these are the types that are supported by the MySQL client, the default being MySQL. And there are advanced parameters that you could specify to pass in upon connecting. Let's apply the changes and now we have a connection object called Linux CBTDB1. There are additional options that can be configured such as the look and feel of the utility, fonts that are used and so forth, and any editor variables and default data types and so forth. Now let's close this particular pop-up and attempt to launch the original tool, the administrator that is, and you'll see in the connection field that Linux CBTDB1 is available. Now let's close this and return to the query browser and you'll see likewise that DB1 is the lone connection that's available. 
and we'll specify the password. We'll connect momentarily and you'll see a new interface. If there are any problems connecting, of course, the utility will return the error. Super. So now we're in. And what are some of the things that we can do? If you notice to the right, you see the schemas. The schemata is listed to the right, and we are in a default schema of HR, which is why it's expanded. But here are the other schemas that are defined on the server, including MySQL. Simply click on it, and when you drill down within a given database or schema, you'll see below in the hierarchy tables. And if you drill down on tables, let's drill down on DB, for example what happens when you double click is it attempts to select star from DB and it sets up an alias for the name of the DB. Now if you drill down on any other table similarly you'll see that the query has been updated to reflect so for example select star from func f and also notice that the utility resembles a web browser in that it has go back and go forward so the recent query is in the history and if we go forward we'll see the select star from func. Now notice that there's an access violation towards the bottom of the MySQL browser. This could just mean that it needs a relaunch. Also notice that if you click down in the section near the MySQL logo, you have the ability to execute queries as well as to execute in a new tab as well as the split tab and execute. Let's go through some of these options. The shortcut to execute a query is simply control enter. So if you have a query like we do here, select star from func alias is f, a control enter will execute the query and return any functions that are defined in this particular table. Additionally, if you simply click the down arrow and click on execute, it'll execute the query. You may also alter the way that the query appears. By default, query results are returned in the first tab. If you'd like this particular query to be executed into a new tab, simply click on execute in new tab and a new tab is generated. It says you try to execute an empty string when well, there's nothing there to be returned so it returns that it's an empty string. Let's pick a table from a database that we know definitely has data. So from within HR we know that the employees table definitely has data. Notice again by double clicking on the table the query is written in such a way where it aliases the name of the table. And initially when you double click on a table, the query is written. When you double click on it a second time, it executes the query. So let's try it again. For the pay scale table, if we double click on it, initially the query is written up top by the MySQL query browser. Select star from HR, pay scale, HR dot pay scale, HR being the fully qualified name or the fully justified name of the database followed by the table name and the table name is alias is P so that if we were to specify individual columns subsequently those columns would be returned using a prefix of P instead of pay underscore scale. So double click once writes the query, double click twice executes the query. It's a shortcut to executing the query. Now if you want to query on certain columns so instead of selecting star or all of the columns simply navigate to the table for example employees click on the the arrow that's pointing to the right in other words expand it so when you expand a table such as employees you then pick the columns that you'd like to have returned in the result set we'll double click on F name also L name and any number of columns that we'd like to see and what will happen is those columns would be written into the query let's refresh this refreshes the result set in the event that the table has changed since we last ran the query. So as mentioned, you can go to any schema, any table, and select only the columns that you're interested in. For example, here's the MySQL database or MySQL schema. The terms are used again interchangeably, schema and table. We'll go to the user table, and by default the query is written to select star from user. But if we drill down and say select host, notice that it selects u.host. If we then double click on user, it selects user and perhaps password. Now it selects three columns or three fields instead of all of the fields. Perhaps we want to see which of these users or the users that are defined within the MySQL.user table has the create as well as drop privileges. Individually, the MySQL query browser will select the columns that we're double clicking on. When we're ready to execute, 
either do a control enter or simply navigate to the upper right hand corner and click on execute and this will return the result set in the same window where the other result sets are returned in other words in the default window which is called result set one and notice here are the columns host user and each column is justified to a specific width causing it to expand the resolution so again try to increase or use higher resolution in your environment to return more columns within the real estate that's available on your screen you can also of course expand or contract the columns so that you can fit them within the resolution that is available so here are the columns here are the create privileges the enum columns that we discussed the enum types storing values of y or n and notice here are the results for user and host. Normally we select user first then host. Notice I just dragged and dropped to substitute one for the other or to rearrange the order in which the columns are presented. Simply drag the column header, user for example, and that moves it over to the left causing host to be second. And notice now user is first, host is second. If we refresh however, host is returned and all of the columns are fully justified again. So drag the columns to the location where you want them and it'll arrange itself nicely or rearrange the query and re-execute it. So for example take the user section and its column, comma that is, and take it and place it before you comma host and that'll cause user to be displayed first. Then we'll go ahead and execute a control enter which will rerun the query causing the user column to be displayed first followed by host. And as you can tell from your knowledge of MySQL user permissions, we have two root users, one at the local host, the other at the name of or the short name of the local host, as well as Linux CBT and two additional users, one set up for the replica account. And also notice that one user doesn't have a password. A neat feature of the query browser is the ability to edit a column directly. So if you knew the 41 digit hash, you could simply click on edit and then type the hash in into the column. For example, by double clicking and then typing in the, the appropriate value. But this is an incorrect value. Now if you were to simply copy the hash from a different user of the database, then the password would be identical. So if we were to simply copy this string and then paste it into the user who currently doesn't have a password defined, then we could update the user table and the user would be forced to use the password for, for the user Linux CBT in order to log in because the hash is the same. Notice also that after having updated a column, the column has been colored as a lavender type color to indicate that it's been changed. This tells us that we need to apply changes and applying changes really executes an update query. And for each column that you update, MySQL's query, query browser, that is, which is like Microsoft's query analyzer for SQL Server, will simply update those columns. So, for example, let's say we wanted to restrict this particular user to a given host, such as localhost. Simply navigate to the column, change it like we just did, and then click off to the side somewhere, and you'll notice that these two columns need to be updated. These two columns really represent the following. Let's launch Notepad a statement which resembles the following update mysql.user followed by set and in this case we updated host so let's just minimize the command window we'd be setting host equivalent to localhost comma password equivalent to a string so this is the command that's going to be executed or the sql D D DML statement, data manipulation language statement that will be executed after clicking on apply changes. So let's go ahead and click apply changes and now the user is restricted to localhost and must identify themselves with this particular password. So the GUI hides all of the intricacies of what we've spent many hours studying, the commands that need to be actually executed under the hood. The query browser is a really capable tool we can navigate to and from the first and last records we can search a given column for a specific record so you click on search you search for a value let's look for Linux CBT for example we can search and replace here you notice it searched all rows and the first column instance that made a match returned and in this case it did 
but we can adjust the search so that it doesn't search all columns. For example, search only in selected columns. So we can select the host column and then perform a search and force it to search only for values in a given column. And we'll click on this particular option and then click on search and it will find it or we happen to be hovered on it. So that sort of flexibility is built into the tool. It allows us to search specific columns for information that matches our criteria. Now again, the default result set for any query that runs is returned to the first tab, but you can execute a query and send it to another tab. And this sets us up to be able to perform result set comparison. So if we execute this query into a new tab, it'll send the results into a new tab. Of course, this one threw an error, but we could send the same results into a new tab. And let's do that. You'll see it says you try to execute an empty string, which is why it threw the error. But again, we could send the information into a new tab, causing it to set itself up for comparison. Now again, we're getting the error because the result set already exists in result set 1. However, we could go ahead and execute a, a totally different query, such as select f name comma l name from employees which is in the HR database so HR dot employees terminated by semicolon the same syntax that you execute in the terminal monitor environment is expected in this particular environment as well let's go ahead and just send this to the default and notice here are the results returned in results set six rather than result set one. Result set one still relates to the user table from the MySQL database whereas result set six is actually information pulled from the HR database, the employees table within. So next we're going to continue looking at some of the neat features of the MySQL query browser. So let's continue exploring this magnificent tool called MySQL Query Browser. Again, it doesn't have the features that you, we found in the administrator tool. If we simply pulled up the administrator tool and specified Linux CBT's password, you'll see immediately that there are definite differences between the two tools. One focuses primarily on server information. These are variables and values that are server specific, such as starting and stopping how much memory the processor information variables used to start the server users defined this particular tool is truly for the regular DBA or for the admin whereas the query browser is a tool that you distribute to your developers as well as to your DBA so developers who have SQL skills as well as your DBA so as mentioned we can create as many tabs as we can fit into our window and then some because we could then scroll left and right you may also from the upper left where I'm currently hovering create a fresh tab with the room to run a new query to produce a new result set so for example let's navigate to the employees table within the HR database and notice that this particular table contains additional fields well we may want to export just other fields let's go with DOB and email for example as well as start date and then execute this particular query and it results in this particular window independent of result sets set six now also notice that as you navigate between your result set the query above changes to reflect the query that was executed to yield the result set so in result set one the query that was run as a select f name l name or f name comma l name from hr.employees in result set six we selected first name last name from hr.employees and in result set seven we selected date of birth email and start date from hr.employees all alias is e of course so three separate queries going on here now let's say this is your complex query and you want to save it you certainly can save this query to a script or a sql file that can be read by any sql compliant DBMS. Simply save as and you'll see the types that are available. The default type being UTF-8 which should cover most character sets in the world. But then you have ANSI as well as well as UTF-16 for extended characters 
as well as SQL script file which is standard within a Microsoft environment with simply a .sql extension. But these are all text files. So if we went with a default UTF-8 and gave it a name that is indicative of the query that we ran, so let's call this particular file HR Employees Query 1 and we'll save it. It'll be saved in my documents and we'll minimize the query browser and navigate to the file system using Explorer and you'll see once we get to my documents that there's a text file. This file can be opened pretty much with any text compliant program. So we'll want to open with or just open and tell it to associate this particular file with a program such as Notepad. And again, there it is. It's text. It's terminated with the semicolon that MySQL expects and it selects the columns that we're interested in. It's basic text but it's a type of text file that is UTF-8 compliant which means any character that's matched by UTF-8 will work within this particular file. If you need extended characters for other languages then perhaps use UTF-16 or a different character set altogether. In either case the query browser supports a wide range of character sets including ANSI for North America as well as UTF for the rest of the world including North America. Now again, data is subject to change. So if you have run a query like we have here and the result set returns as you can see four rows, no differently than in the terminal monitor, just click on refresh to rerun the query. For example, result set 6, we selected first name and last name from the hr.employees table. It reflects four rows. But what if we inserted from a different client? So let's go to the putty window and run an insert. We're going to use HR followed by an insert into. It's always good to know the SQL. The GUI tools are nice, but even within the GUI tool, you'll, tools, you'll need to know the SQL to be able to be productive. So insert into, and that's one of the things the command line shell forces you to do to become as adept as possible with the different SQL commands. So we'll insert into employees then we'll set we should probably have this in our history if we create our history but we'll just go ahead and set the columns that we know are required so let's set F name equivalent to a new employee let's specify that followed by L name and this is an employee that we've deleted when we showed you replication and let's see what else is required for this particular structure. We can tell that, by the way, from the query browser. If you look at the employees table, you can see, by looking at the structure of the table, you can see what's required by the table. Click on Edit Table, and this tells you exactly what's required. Notice that this output resembles what we saw when we looked at the administrator tool. They're both referencing pretty much the same GUI to display to you what is defined for the different fields. Now the fields that are required are the ones that are not null with the exception of course of the ID field which is auto-incremented. It is required but it's populated for us by the DB so we know we need F name, L name, middle name is optional, DOB is required so let's go ahead and fill that into our putty window. We'll just kinda set it side to next to it so that we can see what's required. Let's move the table editor over and return to the putty window it may be hard to get all of these in, so we'll go ahead and set DOB equivalent to the proper format. We'll go at 1960, 0916, followed by start date, and email is also required, so let's set email. Email will be equivalent to at linuxcbt.com. Start date is also required. And we'll set that to 2003-03-30. And if this is all that's required, it should insert, and it did. Now, it threw a warning. Let's show warnings to see what it complained about. Notice it says PayScale ID doesn't have a default value, so that's another required field. PayScale ID not null, and it's probably set to zero as a result of us not specifying a value. Let's select star from employees where f name is equal to eli and let's see what happens here 
So notice for the very last value, which is the pay scale ID, it's set to zero, which is a default. So we could run an update query either from the graphical tool or from the text tool. But again, here's our output. It hasn't been refreshed, and the query browser isn't going to just refresh it for us automatically because that requires hits to the network and so forth. So just click on refresh, and then you'll see the new record added. That forces the query to be rerun on the server. So there's the new value, but in this particular query, we're not selecting all fields. So we could go ahead and select F name, comma, L name, comma, pay underscore scale underscore ID. And let's rerun this query. Now we'll have pay scale ID in the column. And the neat thing about this again is we simply double click on the column, click edit or edit first then double click and then set the pay scale ID once we navigate off the query browser has noted that this particular field needs to be updated when we click apply changes the update query will run now of course via the query log we can tell what's recently run on the server from this particular host if we quit backslash Q SUN and navigate into var live mysql because all operations are being done on the server. We can monitor the last file that you see there, Linux CBT DB1, because it contains all queries run. So this particular file contains the queries. If we were to tail it, Linux CBT DB1.log, you'll see all queries that run. Let's go ahead and execute a watch. And we'll watch tail and the, the watch will refresh every two seconds. So you'll see what's affected on the server. Let's go ahead and click apply changes and then return to the putty window and you'll see there's the update statement update HR dot employees set pay scale on the square ID equals 20 where ID equals 6 it matched the it being the query browser matched on an integer field or a numeric field rather than on a typical string field but nonetheless it updated the proper column but it's a simple update statement that's run by virtue of double clicking on the graphical interface let's say we wanted to insert a new value no sweat you can run the insert statement here as well the same insert we just ran from the shell environment can be run from the the graphical environment simply because it's all the same SQL that's being run let's find it in our history and once we found it we will attempt to run it from the graphical environment there's the insert statement so we'll just take this whole block and we'll right button it putting it in, or placing it into memory we'll open a new tab and then paste the query there's the query now we just need to set it we need to strip of course the Linux shell all of this needs to be stripped up to insert so we'll insert into employees setting a new first name so let's go ahead we'll set this particular value and let's set the last name let's go ahead and set a date of birth with the proper syntax and email similarly first name at linuxcbt.com and the pay scale ID should not be zero it is required so let's go ahead and set that pay scale ID start data set and the last column should be and by the way you can place your values on separate lines if you want pay scale no differently than in the terminal monitor let's set pay scale ID equals to 20 or we can go with 15 doesn't matter and then execute the query with a control enter and notice it through the query could not be executed below let's check what's actually causing it to not execute there should be some sort of syntax error causing this to fail which we can rectify rather quickly so we have pay scale ID set to 15 and we've terminated it with a semicolon so far it looks clean let's try it again and it says the table MySQL employees below this is where the error is explaining what's going wrong doesn't exist so it's trying to insert into mysql.employees so again this can be all on separate lines but what you need to do is just ensure that you fully qualify your tables or select a default so in other words our current database is the mysql database so the use is set to mysql so let's fully qualify this by specifying hr.employees and then control enter now the query has run one row affected by the last command 
and no problems. We can ignore this access violation that's just win specific, but the query did run. So if we return to a recent dump from this particular table, anyone will do, and click refresh, we'll see the new employees. Here are two new employees inserted into the database. Result set 6 will also show the new employee added in, and it's working exactly how we expect it to work. So we can execute queries from the query window. This is considered the query window. Any type of query is permitted, but sometimes if you're out of context, as we were, we were in the context of the MySQL database, you'll need to then execute a fully qualified name or specify a fully qualified name. Now, you may be wondering, how do you know which database you're currently in? If you notice above where it tells you the name of the user you're logged in as, where I'm hovering, right above the go back and refresh, it tells you the user you're logged in as, the server you're logged into, the port that you're connected to, and also the default DB, or the DB that you're currently in. You can change that DB via the query window or by selecting a different database over to the right. But you know that the command is simply use, so go ahead and just use HR, followed by control enter, and notice above the default database has switched from MySQL to HR and it works for other databases or schemas that are defined so we can go ahead and use contact followed by control enter now we're within the context of contact again the query browser is designed like a web browser according to the folks at MySQL and it's obvious because you have a refresh like a browser you have a go back and you have next if you want to rerun a query or a recently run query click on go back and notice it, go, it switch from use H, from use contact to use HR if we click next this takes us forward and it returns to use contact so back next will actually alternate between previously run queries and you can go back into your history this is all maintained while you're running so we know we're within contact we click go back to go to use HR followed by a control enter causing us to switch contacts into HR and then the recently run query would have run of course because without the fully qualified name because we're now within the proper context so we have all these different result tabs open now what if we wanted to save a result set let's say we just want first name last name and email to save it so that it's exportable to an application well click on a new result set window note the database that you're currently in the schema that you're currently in and then execute the select statement either manually because you know how or just drill down on employees which defaults to a select star open employees and then pick out the columns you want first name last name as well as email then execute the query so you double click on the database name or the table name the first column the second column and in this case the last column then control enter here are the columns that we wanted and this is all exportable again to any sort of typical delimited files such as tab comma excel etc we have our three columns from our huge table if you want to export it very easy you can right button or you can go up top to file export result set and here are the formats that are supported if you select excel it saves it as an excel file that can be read in excel xp or higher if you go ahead and select comma separated then it's, it will output the file to a CSV. Let's go ahead and output this as F name or first. Let's call it first, last, email, result, set, dot CSV. That's what will be saved. It's been exported to our home directory, which is over here, and there's a result set. If we double click on it, you'll notice each value is included between quotes with the column headers preserved. We can skip the column headers if we want to, or simply go in the file and open the file and remove it. And here are the records. And each record is returned in order of how it's presented in the database. Of course, we could influence the order by using an order by. So we could change this query, for example, using standard SQL and simply say something like the following order by let's say F name and then rerun the query using control enter so then it's alphabetically ordered ascending 
or perhaps we want it to be descending. Let's go ahead and rerun it. Now it's from T to A versus A to T. So you can do all of this and then export it. Let's go ahead and export this again. This is def descending this time. And we'll call it the same name. However, we'll just add to the end of it so that we know that it's a descending order. And then we'll examine th this file using the text editor. Let's close this notepad instance. We no longer need it. And then return to my documents and open the new text file. And there are the results in descending order. So you can output it to any of the formats that are currently supported. And this is, again, subject to change. And those formats include CSV, HTML, XML, Excel, as well as PLIS. These are all types that you can use to save the results. You may also simply just save as and save the query itself as one of the supported types, which include ANSI as well as SQL script as well as general UTF-8 and 16. So again, this interface is neat. It's like a browser. It's tabbed based, kind of like Mozilla Firefox, and different things are going on in the individual tabs. Different result sets are displayed with their corresponding rows returned and the ability, the ability to edit any of the columns and to navigate to and from the first and last records and to search any of the columns all in stored within each of the tabs. Each tab operates similarly to a MySQL terminal monitor window. So it's like having multiple MySQL terminal monitor windows. Now notice over to the right you have another box beneath where the schemas are. These are the schemas. Schemas are self-explanatory and also beneath the schemas you have views, you also have functions as well as stored procedures. Here's a function. If you double click on it, it actually brings up the function and you can actually edit the function as well so you certainly can edit it just right button on it click edit function and here's the syntax that we specified to create the function ditto for stored procedures double click on it it brings up the stored procedure in a tab a fresh tab a right button on it followed by edit procedure will allow you to edit it now if you want to drop a procedure simply right button drop procedure this will drop the procedure from the database. And as mentioned, if there are views that are defined, when you open a given schema, such as a database, this is the HR schema, you'll see views as well as stored routines. So let's look, for example, here's employee list. Employee list is actually a view. Right button, edit view, and here's the syntax that was used to create the view. The edit view is similar to running a show create view, such as is the case with tables and columns. So this is the view, and if you expand the views columns by clicking on the right arrow or the arrow pointing to the right you'll see the actual columns that are returned by the view this view returns L name F name date of birth and salaries so it should contain a join we can go ahead and execute the view double clicking on it by the way will allow you to execute the view as well and it will return just those columns that are of interest so simply bring the view up by double clicking on it and then you'll see the columns that the view will return. This view again performs a join, but here they are. And again, this is all exportable. File, export result set. Let's send it to an XML file, and we'll call this view employees view. And since it's the only view, that works out well. And there's a new file. It's an XML file which you can also open in a program such as Notepad, but it's just, of course, delimited using XML syntax. But all the results are returned, and it's importable into any XML compliant program. So that's a little bit about the schema window. Any object that you can marry to a, a schema will be reflected beneath the schema, such as a stored routine, which includes functions and procedures, as well as views, as well as tables, as well as triggers, and so forth. And below, in this box that we mentioned earlier, you'll see if you double click on data manipulation all of the possible data manipulation commands and you'll get help for those commands here's the syntax when using delete here's the syntax when using insert so the help is integrated help of course is available in the help section but that's self-explanatory and there are references to PHP and C APIs in the event that you want to extend MySQL to those platforms but below you'll get syntax help for the different types of commands, DDLs as well as DMLs, here are the DDL commands, MySQL utilities such as describe, describe and use, 
Describe, as you know, describes the schema of a table. And transactional and locking commands, such as commit, rollback, save, set transaction, start transaction, and so forth. You also have a functions tab. These are the functions that are supported. Here are the operators. Operators should be self-explanatory. It's usually all of the equal and greater than less than signs and various ways of expre expressing those, those symbols. Control flow functions, if, case, and so forth. String functions, we use concatenate. But here are all of the other string functions supported by this version of MySQL. So you can use this to learn about those functions as well. It's a great reference. Here are the numeric functions. Date and time functions. You'll find date diff in there somewhere. And it should be in here somewhere. Here it is, date diff, which we have defined in one of our functions. Cast functions, full text search functions, and other functions. So there are many types of functions available. The password function we've used to set passwords. And parameters, global parameters, dynamic parameters, and local parameters. So you have a lot going on in this lower box. And in the schema box, you can deal with objects that are tied to a schema or to all of the schemas by switching contexts. And by double clicking on a particular schema, you silently change the context. Notice up top, it shows that you're in test. If we double click on MySQL, it now shows MySQL. You double click on information schema, you're now there. And if you double click on HR, you've switched to the HR schema. So we switch in and out of context or in and out of the, the different schemas by simply double clicking on the schemas. So you have to be careful where you execute your queries by double checking always up top. Or just fully qualify all of your queries and you'll never have that problem. Super. So we can open new result sets, navigate between the result sets, export result sets, and so forth. It's a really capable interface. There's a lot more that you can do with this interface. And again, the query browser runs not only on Windows, but also on Nix-based systems, including Mac OS X. So it's a capable tool. Use it. Get accustomed to it. Because from the perspective of a Windows box, you can manipulate multiple MySQL instances throughout your environment. As we mentioned, monitor options can be configured to search for or to scan the existence and presence of MySQL servers on your network. And there are various actions such as managing MySQL instances and so forth that you can do by just double clicking on this particular monitor. So use this as well as a way or a means to connecting to and monitoring your different MySQL instances and use the query browser when you want to execute raw queries against the server at any time to return result sets that you're going to export or just simply want to see on the screen. Besides that, the official interface I still think is the old-fashioned MySQL terminal monitor which doesn't require much and is cross-platform capable. So is the MySQL query browser, but of course it requires the graphical front end, whereas the terminal monitor really doesn't. And since you're dealing with two-dimensional data anyway, just rows and columns, it's not much of a big deal to use the terminal environment from the shell. But just know that the query browser is there, and if for those of you who are familiar with Oracle's Enterprise Manager or Microsoft's Enterprise Manager, it's reassuring to know that MySQL, the database management system that's growing in popularity, has a formidable graphical interface for managing the server as well as for executing queries.